gross domestic product, sometimes expressed on a per capita basis, is one of the leading indicators used by governments, investors, international financial institutions, economists, and others to measure national economic performance. In Africa, almost all governments, whatever their alleged ideological and prog programmatic differences, usually set themselves the primary objective of significantly increasing the rate of economic growth. The implicit and rarely discussed assumption is that more economic growth will deliver more development in the sense of economic modernization, more decent jobs, more social progress, and so on. Complementing this assumption is the view that developing countries, because of their lack of money and savings, need to attack foreign capital at all costs by implementing structural reforms. Another major assumption is the view that developing countries could aspire to one day obtain the income per capita of richer countries. This is the catch-up hypothesis. Yet, these intellectual beliefs have been challenged in the past by economists from the Global South, such as Franco-Egyptian Samir Ramin and Brazilian Celso Furtado. Furtado criticized, for example, the catch-up view by making two arguments in his book called The Myth of Economic Development, published five decades ago. First, economic development in the Global North cannot be evenly reproduced in the Global South, as it is based on the appropriation of Global South resources. Second, as production and consumption styles in the Global North heavily rely on a significant waste of biophysical resources, a pattern amplified by the cult of plant obsolescence, any attempt at generalizing the so-called Western way of life will prove ecologically unsustainable and will likely lead to the collapse of human civilization. Furtado criticism did not imply that most of the world located in the global south will be condemned to suffer from poverty and inequality. His point was rather that another type of economic organization was needed. Contra Furtado, global north countries and the international financial institutions under their control have been selling the catch-up view to developing countries while pursuing policies that could only fail them even using their own GDP growth metric, at least over the long run. To illustrate the limitations of growthism in Africa, let us take the case of Equatorial Guinea. With a population of 1.7 million in 2022, Equatorial Guinea is an oil exporting country that achieved exceptional economic growth rates between the late 1990s and the early 2000s. Between 1994 and 2004, its real GDP per capita increased tenfold, representing an annual economic growth rate of 33.5% over this 10-year period. In 2012, Equatorial Guinea had a GDP per capita in purchasing power parity PPP terms slightly higher than that of Spain, its former colonizer. It was therefore the richest African country at that time. Yet, Equatorial Guinea was ranked among the least developed countries until 2017. How could a country richer on paper than Spain be considered among the world's poorest? To explain this paradoxical situation, we need to look at the country's balance of payments and in particular its primary income balance. The primary income balance is one of the three components of the current account, alongside the trade balance and the secondary income balance. The primary income balance represents the difference between primary income transferred abroad and primary income received from abroad. The concept of primary income in the balance of payments terminology refers to returns on foreign capital. That means interest on foreign debt on the one hand and repatriate profits and dividends from foreign tech investment on the other. What does Equatorial Guinea primary income balance show? Since 2000, net income payments abroad have ranged from a low of 20% of GDP to a high of 66.4%. In other words, every year since 2000, the equivalent of at least 20% of Equatorial Guinea's GDP 
has been transferred abroad, in particular for the benefit of the oil companies operating there. The primary income balance represents the difference between GNI gross national income and GDP gross domestic product. Most countries in the south, like Equatorial Guinea, have a GDP higher than their national income due to a chronic deficit in the primary income balance. In accounting terms, as production must equal income, this situation means that part of the income generated by domestic activity is transferred abroad. So in countries like, in the case of countries like Equatorial Guinea, where the economy is heavily dominated and owned by foreign capital, GDP growth reflects first and foremost the economic health of the colonial type enclaves. Equatorial Guinea is certainly an extreme example, but its case is illustrative of the economic extraversion seen in most African countries where economic growth is generally driven by improved commodity prices and when these collapse by recourse to foreign currency borrowing, often at prohibitive interest rates. This extraverted model of accumulation is further compounded by the asymmetries of the international financial system which makes developing countries suffer from a transfer problem, meaning that developing countries must earn the US dollars that allow them to buy their needed imports. If their export income is not enough due to resource poverty or due to the squeeze operated by foreign capital and the local elites, these countries generally have to issue debts in foreign currencies. Yet, servicing these debts require a significant growth of the export income controlled by the governments. But this logic is not sustainable and must result in recurrent debt crisis. On the one hand, commodities exported by African countries have volatile prices. They are also subject to a secular deterioration of the terms of term, meaning that over the long run, commodity dependent countries have to export more and more to have access to the same basket of imports. On the other hand, due to the power of credit rating agencies and the creditor bias of institutions such as the International Monetary Fund, African countries are structurally exposed to high costs in terms of accessing foreign finance. The imposition of free trade policies and other measures hostile to industrialization the control of export sectors and earnings by foreign capital and the high cost of foreign finance are the main structural factors locking African countries in a situation of external debt trap. For most African countries, economic growth episodes can often be considered as a form of borrowed growth in the sense that they have been achieved under conditions that are not sustainable and that will pave the way to an austerity cycle that will annul previous economic gains, at least from the perspective of the majority of their populations. If I take the case of Equatorial Guinea again, its real GDP per capita had decreased by 59% between 2008 and 2022. The same pattern is observed in, uh, in the other neighboring countries like Gabon and Cameroon, which are still behind the peak GDP per capita they, respect, they respectively achieved in 1976 and 1986. What economic anthropologist Karl Polanyi called, quote, the uncritical reliance on the alleged self-healing virtues of unconscious growth, end of quote, has been wreaking havoc on the developing world. GDP growth is supposed to be the universal panacea to economic and social problems. Yet, if we just look at China, probably the most successful country ever, and which probably will never be emulated again, we can see the limitation of that belief. The multiplication of Chinese real GDP by a factor of 63 between 1970 and 2020 certainly brought significant structural transformation and economic progress. However, this exceptional record has not been enough, for example, to bring full employment in decent jobs. So why should we continue to believe that more growth will be enough to deliver social progress for all? In our times marked by ecological distress and climate change, we know that past industrialization models driven by fossil fuels can no longer work for humanity. The argument here is not to say that developing countries should not grow economically speaking, but rather that they should 
target real income, real outcomes like a healthy population, full employment, sustainable environment in place of the blind goal of maximizing GDP growth.